Thank you. All right, got my slides up. Okay, so um, you know how now dead Steve Jobs, whenever he has a new iPhone and iPod, he walks around. So I thought it was kind of cool. So I told him, I want to be walking around. Um, I do want to make sure that you can hear me, though. I was asked to talk about the advanced hemodynamic management, which I have passion in. I'm going to focus on SAH, but this is intensive care critical care conference, so we'll use the SAH, or the brain injury, as a model. So I'm going to skip some of the brain-related stuff, which I have a lot of talks on, ICP, MAP, et cetera, and go right to this slide, where you see a brain vessels are narrow. I use brain as an example, even in a critical care conference, because your liver, your lungs, even kidneys, they wait for you 12 hours, 24 hours. They can tolerate. Guess what? Your brain does not tolerate. So I think the critical care management becomes even more important when it comes to brain vessel narrowing down. If you don't augment, augment the flow, the brain will melt. So I think that's a good model for intensivists like us to think about how important it is do what we do in the intensive care unit. When you want to augment the hemodynamic profile to optimize the blood supply to the injured brain, the vessels are narrowed down. It's incredibly important for us. Even if you don't run neurosurgical and neurological ICU, you have to understand that what you're doing at the heart and cardiovascular hemodynamic level has a direct impact on brain oxygenation. As you, some of you know very well, it means you're going to expand the volume. Because without the volume, no pressure, right? You're going to also increase the blood pressure. Because the increase in blood pressure means what? Increase in cerebral perfusion pressure, which is the same for any other organ system. MAP goes up, your perfusion pressure has to go up when all the other variables are held constant. Cardiac output, as you know, is incredibly important because that's how delivery of oxygen, among other things, play an important role. It is important for us to also understand that when you are augmenting the volume, right? There's a heart pump, there's a volume, there's a pressure, and there's a vas vascular resistance, right? These are the only few very important variables that we talk about. So let's talk about the volume. Don't we spend hours in the ICU? I don't know about you, but I spent hours in the ICU trying to understand what the volume is, right? And then you, you look at these different fellows and residents debating, he thinks you're dry, she thinks you're wet, you, you have no idea, and you, you, you want to look like as if you know, but you, you're not really sure. Clinical variables are tough to be reliable. Well, the important concept I'd like to highlight, though, is that if you have a glass, that's the, your blood vessel, full of water, it doesn't matter what your senior person says, or junior, or whoever says, I want more volume, more volume, volume, it's only going to go elsewhere. It's important that we pay attention to this, especially in a real patient like this, because we think that volume is so good. And sometimes we do it prophylactically, that we actually end up creating a lung injury. And if your lung is full of water, there's no way your brain can receive the oxygen. The prophylactic Triple H therapy. I hope your country or anywhere in the East Asia don't do that. But it's still in America, depressingly enough, depressingly enough, they give volume. Oh, you're going to have vasospasm. Give crystalloid or balanced crystalloid. 150 cc's an hour to 200 cc's an hour. Oh, give some albumin every four hours. This is old medicine. And we used to do that, though. Until some of my colleagues at Columbia and New York have proven to the world that prophylactic, prophylactic Triple H therapy, you can only increase the filling pressure and maybe make patients pee more. But you don't really augment the blood flow to the brain and does not help them with the perfusion of the brain. This is the graph that all of us know. This is rather too basic. But the graph that I'd like to talk about a lot, especially with my colleagues and, and, and trainees, we know that the frank stalin curve dictates that you don't want to be down here. You want to be up here. And it has to do with the pressure on the x-axis. If you go up, 
cardiac output goes up, only to the point and after which it reaches a plateau. Now, take a look at this side, where your volume is actually less. You're going to the left side, meaning the right atrial pressure or end diastolic volume is less, and yet the cardiac output is higher. Why? Because you got the better engine, right? Instead of the 1970 diesel, now you got twin turbo, much more efficient and more quiet and higher performance. Very, very important. This is very basic, I know, but it's something that we must talk about and must think about. Delivery of oxygen to any organs, end organ system, include, including the brain, has to do with this, my favorite, my favorite equation, hemoglobin, right? We, we talk about hemoglobin a lot, sometimes in a negative way. Oh, what's the evidence? I don't want the blood transfusion. No, trally, no, no, sure. These are all valid points. But from the physiological standpoint, when your brain is desperately asking for more oxygen, yeah, great. You're gonna wait until 6.9 of hemoglobin, your brain is dead. A lot more cells than it needs to be. Because by the simple physiology, I didn't say give, give more hemoglobin to improve long-term outcome. No, think of the DO2. Your DO2 cannot go up if you challenge them to drop hemoglobin based on this simple mathematics. There's no argument about the math. SAO2 and a fraction of PAO2 and cardiac output, I think these are very, very important. So hence, I talk about the volume and keeping, making sure people are euvolemic and optimizing the delivery of oxygen. When the end organ system, such as injured brain, especially in the setting of vasospasm, is desperate for oxygen, cardiac output is incredibly important. You may say, well, Kivan, how, how do you know that? Prove that to me. You know, we like proving things these days. So, well, this is my patient, and if you look at, some of you have seen this graph before during my international talk. If you have all the other variables held constant, for example, hemoglobin is sta stable. You're, you're not in a septic shock. Your P vascular resistance is the same. And I can drive up the cardiac output, up or down with milrinone or dobutamine, whatever inotropic agents. How do I know that? Because I got cardiac continuous output monitoring. Doesn't matter what machine you use, but some sort of a monitoring. And when I jack up the cardiac output from five liters to eight and a half, look at the PBTO2, it doubles. The partial brain, partial brain oxygen tension in the brain doubles. This is not a big deal if you have normal brain. But guess what? It's a big deal, it's a huge deal if your brain is A, injured, and B, spastic from the vessel that it's not receiving enough oxygen, critical. Here's another um, study from a colleague of mine from Brigham, Harvard, and UT, looking at you can measure and see, you know how we like to prove things? You can see the perfusion deficit, the red, yellow becoming blue, when you augment the hemodynamic profile. In this particular case where neosinephrine or phenylephrine is used, your MAP goes up, your perfusion deficit goes up, and you can see it with your eyes. In this case, uh, uh, so this is before and after, and you can also see the same thing. Without change, much changing the uh, map, you can increase the ionotropic agents and uh, elevate the cardiac output. You can also see the same favorable uh, outcome in terms of the oxygen supply. So for vasospasm, just as a model, uh, I don't know if all of you take care of vasospasm patients on a daily basis, but again, we're using it as a model. Volume depletion is bad. You cannot have a good CBF if your volume is down, right? Pressure, volume, linear. So you need to have good volume. So if you're dry, it's bad. Now if you give too much uh, fluid though, prophylactically especially, and you can lead to this. So it's equally bad. So then, what are you exactly saying? Well, I'm saying you need to be perfect, just right, you volumic state. For my next nine minutes and 30 seconds, I wanna talk about two things. How do you know that you're you volumic? And how do you 
optimize the hemodynamic profile using some of the late, later technologies that you're, you guys are probably using on a daily basis. How do you know? You go around in, in the morning rounds, whether a patient is septic shock with a low tone or cardiogenic shock with a great tone, but the pump is not working, or the, your pump's working fine, your vessel's normal, but your brain vessel's narrowed down. How do you know that someone is uvolemic or not? Well, you go, what's the, what's the input? Where's the nurse? What's the output? Give me the I's and O's. What's I minus O? So if, if you, there's more input, you're, you're, you're wet. If there's more output, you're dry. Hmm. Uh, labs, sodium. Oh, sodium's up, hypovolemic, hypernatremic. Oh, you gotta be dry. Skin, oh, I can touch the skin. Yeah, you do that. Oh, I can tell. Uh, JVD, whatever that is. Uh, urine color, if your urine is yellow, you're dry, your urine is white, you're nicely hydrated. Nice, good, we do that all the time. I, I actually do all of these. And, and CVP, great. Um, Paul's not here, Paul Merrick, my good friend, is not here. He hates CVP, you know that. He's published 10,000 papers how CVP is useless. But, <laughs> but, but, but so I think it's sometimes useful. But, but, but just some people seem so sure. They go, I know. Yeah, great. Sometimes they're not right. We know that. Well, so we need better, more information. We need a little bit more, more scientific uh, monitoring devices and information than some people going around in the morning and say, I know, because I am older or whatever. Well, take a look at the head-to-head the -head analysis of CVP or the heart rate. So if you're dry, CVP will be go down. If you're dry, heart rate will go up. If you're dry and hypovolemic, your BP will go down. None of which really compa in comparison with a, a, a later model of SVV, for example, stroke volume variation, turns out to be good. Even central venous pressure and a wedge pressure, the good old dead swan uh, uh, parameter, it's all over the place. Looks like somebody's been shooting all over the wall. There's no pattern to it. I have nothing to disclose in terms of the PICO or uh, Edwards Life Science of Vigileo or EV1000, but these are later technology. I think these are way better than ins and outs. I think these are way better than CVP. Quite frankly, there's no parameter or device that is the best. I think we gotta look at every parameter and it gives you more parameters in a dynamic, continuous fashion rather than looking at a pressure to assess the volume. You're looking at the CVP or wedge pressure. You're looking at a pressure to assess the volume. Is that accurate? And if you looked at the pressure five minutes ago, does that hold true five minutes later? Probably not. So you need a dynamic parameter. Looking at all these different parameters in a real time gives you where you are on the Frank Stalin curve, where you are in terms of extra lung water index. Some of these stuff are not foreign to you. We've been talking about this type of technology for the past, what, seven years in all critical care conferences. Stroke volume variation do, it does trick you. Sometimes it gives you normal value, and two seconds later, horrible value, and you understand, you don't understand where you are, right? And you start cursing. Oh, that, that company, it's normal 3% here, and then all of a sudden 25% in two seconds. You, ah, bogus. Well, no machine's perfect, but the concept is a good one for us to remember. Stroke volume variation, as you know, if you're hypovolemic or you're a volume responder, depending on the respiration, the variation will go up. If the variation goes up, classically between 10 to 15%, anything above that will be a positive responder if you give them fluid responsiveness challenge. It's an useful information. For those of you who are from the swan gans arena or, or the uh, era, the thermodilution can be used, but, but the PICO 2's thermodilution method is a lot more, I think, advanced than classic. For the next four minutes and 52 seconds, I'd like to show you a couple of videos, and I hope our, our IT team can show us some of the basic videos. This is something we can do at the bedside, the critical care ultrasound. Right? Right? That looks really, really good. Let's play that one more time. You can see it doesn't take that much of a training at the bedside to really show. Take a look at that. 
There's a huge difference between those two, right? If you go back to the normal one, right? Nice, robust contraction, as opposed to a boggy, dilated, it's moving, but it's not really contracting. When the LV dilated dysfunctional status is seen, it would be absurd to just increase the peripheral vasculature resistance. It would be important for you to not use the phenylephrine, but focus more on inotropic agent. Classic, neuro, uh, cra classic critical care 101. IVC diameter and collapsibility, my another favorite. I don't know about you guys, but take a look at this. It's not collapsing. It is not collapsing. Why? Because it's full that in that patient, you would not want to give more volume. Maybe you should cut down on the volume. The 50% or more collapse during a uh, continuous uh, critical care bedside ultrasonography gives you a very, very good idea about the right atrial pressure. And, and you can estimate what kind of volume responder or non-volume responder this patient would be. It takes two seconds, put it right on the patient's body at the bedside as an intensivist and you can measure the IVC. If it collapses like that, as opposed to like this, you know, you know that the patient will positively augment, if you, if you give volume, will respond and that will increase the cardiac output. That some of the organs might be desperately asking for that extra cardiac output you can also measure the delta V max at the outflow LV track using the ultrasonography and look at the difference between the minimum and the maximum. And if the variation is big, you know that depending on the respiratory cycle that it suggests an intravascular volume depletion and positive volume responder. So I'd like to conclude by saying welcome to the dynamic and not static Hemodynamic 2017. Thank you.